Dear congregation, I spoke with Reverend Vendeswalk last evening, and he asked me to send his warm love to you, and together we want to wish you, together with our consistory as well and our families, to your family, God's richest blessings on this Thanksgiving Day, a day wonderfully set aside by our government to call on God's name, to worship Him, and to enjoy one another in our homes and in our families. The very first Thanksgiving commemorated in America was in 1621. That previous December, the pilgrims landed on the bleak, wintry coasts of Massachusetts, and there they lost half of the 103 people that landed that long, cold winter. Nevertheless, that summer of 1621, they did harvest a a rather large crop for a small group that was left. And Governor Winthrop decided that November to hold a Thanksgiving Day. And from there on in, intermittently, Thanksgiving Days were held after great events in America, events of God's intervening hand. In 1789, George Washington declared the first national Thanksgiving Day. And those two were held intermittently from time to time in the decades that followed. And it wasn't until 1863 that Abraham Lincoln declared a national Thanksgiving Day to be in effect every single year. And so since that year, we have had a long-standing tradition in our land of annual Thanksgiving Day, in which we acknowledge God for all the blessings He showered upon us and how critical it is in our day in which more and more holidays and Thanksgiving Day and other things of that nature become mere secular days of festivity, that we gather in God's house, begin our day in God's house, worshiping the living God. And I want to commemorate this Thanksgiving Day with you in worship by looking with you at what has been fondly called Old 100, Psalm 100, a psalm very precious to the church of all ages. And I will read again only verse 4 at this time. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Our theme then this morning, with God's help, is Old 100's Call to Thanksgiving. And I want to look at four aspects of Thanksgiving with you. First, the propriety of Thanksgiving. Second, the prescription of Thanksgiving. Third, the purpose of Thanksgiving. And fourth, the practice of Thanksgiving. Old 100's Call to Thanksgiving. The propriety, prescription, purpose, and practice of thanksgiving. Psalms 92 through 100 are a series of psalms thought to be sung at Israel's last annual feast at the end of harvest. The families would come together in Jerusalem to offer a peace offering and then a thank offering to the Lord. And they'd sing these psalms. And tradition tells us that Psalm 100 
was always the final, fitting, closing doxology of thanksgiving. Now, though the Psalms command us 35 times to give God thanks, Psalm 100 is the only one you notice above the psalm that is titled a psalm of praise, or as it could be translated, a psalm of thanksgiving. In this psalm, the Holy Spirit reminds us, first of all, of the propriety of thanksgiving. Propriety is a word that simply means the, the fittedness, the suitability, the quality or state of being proper. It is proper to give God thanks. Now the psalm begins already with that assumption. It begins by saying, make a joyful noise. A Jewish worship service was a, was a rather noisy affair. The people sang very loudly as they were commanded by God to do. In Psalm 98, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all the earth make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. And that reminds us, doesn't it, of verse 2 in our chapter this morning. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before His presence with singing. And then verse 4, enter into His gates with thanksgiving and into His courts with praise. You see, this is fitting to lift up our voices, to sing praise to the Almighty, to engage in this wonderful and joyous delight and duty, to rejoice before God and render Him thanksgiving. Now, far too often, we are sluggish in thanking God. And we need to ask ourselves, don't we, why? Why are we so sluggish to perform this obvious duty? Why are we so quick to focus on our burdens and our complaints, but so slow to open up before God this duty of propriety? This duty of thanksgiving. And I wonder, I wonder if we've ever stopped to think about this, that we are not just to, to give God thanks in the process of our worship, but we are to enter, our text says, we are to enter into His gates with thanksgiving. As we walk into church, We are to be filled with thanksgiving. We have a place to worship. We're going to hear the living God. We are to cultivate the spirit of thanksgiving, even as we gather for worship. So we're not to enter the church indifferent. We're not to enter the very last second and tired and worn out from hustling and having no preparation. We're to prepare our souls and we're to enter into the courts of God with thanksgiving. That's what the psalmist says. Do we think about that? Too often, I'm afraid, we don't understand What a joyful thing worship is. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All ye lands, the psalmist says, when you worship God, it is your duty, it's propriety, it's fitting to exclaim His praises, to be filled with gratitude and thanksgiving. Psalm 148 says, To kings and peoples and judges, both young men and maidens, old men and children, let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name alone is excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. So that means we are always to be thankful. That's what Paul says in the New Testament too. Always be thankful at all ages. You too, children, boys and girls, you are to be thankful God commands you, both young men and maidens, old men and children, praise the Lord, enter into His courts with thanksgiving. 
In other words, we're never to have vacation from Thanksgiving. It's to be our duty every single day. We ought to wake up in the morning and we ought to say, Lord, I'm alive this morning. I thank thee so much. I thank thee so much that today I have the opportunity to serve thee. Give me someone to talk to about thee today. I, I, today I have the opportunity to honor thy name and to, to, to work in thy kingdom in one way or another, be it as a mother, be it in the office, be it as a minister. Today, I have opportunities to thank thee. Help me at the very beginning to, to have a joyful spirit. There's so much to thank God for. So much that we scarcely realize. Boys and girls, I just read this week that 250 million children under the age of 12 work seven days a week in third world countries, never have a break. And in our country, sometimes children whine when mom gives them just a little job. We should be thankful, boys and girls. Thankful to work. Thankful to be obedient to your mom and dad. Thankful for your mom and dad. Thankful for school. Sometimes I hear children talk about school as if school's a burden instead of a gift and a privilege. We ought to be thankful. Children and adults. And actually, our text sets before us this morning three reasons for the propriety of this thanksgiving. The first is, God is our creator. God is our creator. That's what it says in verse 3. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. Therefore enter into my courts with thanksgiving. You didn't make yourself. God made you. Those eyes that you see through are the gift of God. Those hands that you have are the gift of God. The soul that you have is the gift of God. God wants to be praised by every aspect of His creation. He wants to be praised by your hands, your feet, your eyes, your soul. He's your Creator. He's made you for His pleasure, for His glory, for His design, to hallow Him, to thank Him. He's adorned you in paradise with His image. Yes, we forfeited it, but that doesn't change things, you see. From God's perspective, we are called to thank God. Because He made us. And because He keeps us. He's not only our creator, He's our provider. He's our upholder. He's involved in every heartbeat we have. He's involved in every drop of rain He gives us, every ray of sunshine, every bit of food on your plate, boys and girls, every dollar you put in your billful. It all comes from your Maker. He is the Lord. Know that the Lord, He is our God. He has made us, not we ourselves. He keeps us. While we sleep, who is awake? While we work, who is watching over us? While we travel through this earth surrounded with danger, who is protecting us? While a significant population of this world is suffering from hunger, who is supplying us? While millions have never heard the word of God, who's giving it to us? The Lord. Know the Lord. Know that the Lord, He is our God. He has made us. And not we ourselves. He is blessing us as our creator, as our provider. It is a matter of propriety. To give him thanksgiving for he is our creator. But number two, we belong to his covenant. 
We belong to his covenant. Verse 3 says, we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. He has entered into covenant with us, every one of us. He doesn't say to Israel here, I'm just entering into covenant with part of the people, just with those who are truly converted. No, no, he says, we are his people, all Israel, marked with the mark of circumcision. So this morning we can say, congregation, even though not everyone in this building this morning is saved, we are marked. We are marked with the mark of baptism. We've received that sign. It's a sign of our confirmation that we are in God's covenant. We are under His pale of covenantal grace and blessing. We are the sheep of His pasture. And we owe Him, therefore, thanksgiving for the wonderful opportunities to hear His Word, to be taken into the corporate prayers of His people, to worship with the children of God. God said of Israel, Thou art an holy people unto Jehovah thy God, and Jehovah thy God has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto Himself above all the people that are upon the face of the earth. That's what can be said of us this morning as well. 99% of the people of this world do not have the opportunity to come to God's house and hear the doctrines of free and sovereign grace from Sabbath to Sabbath in the reformed experiential way that is true to the Scriptures. We are extraordinarily blessed. And therefore we owe God extraordinary Thanksgiving. And that is true of you too, boys and girls, not only in church, but also in school. I grew up in a public school. We didn't have a Christian school that my parents felt comfortable sending us to. I look at what you learn in school about Bible stories as in elementary school already. And I think, if only I had that when I was young. What a privilege every day to go to school and hear the Word of God. What a gift to have teachers who, who, who are burdened for your souls. We are his sheep. This is a, a covenantal blessing you get. Going to school every day. What a blessing to have parents who talk to us about the ways of God. Children, you are called by God's name. You are baptized. You're getting the message at home, at school, at church. What a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful privilege you have. Are you filled? Is your heart just swelling with thanksgiving for all the blessings God is showering upon you? We owe God thanksgiving. It's propitious because He's created us. Because he's covenanted with us. And then for many of us, we can say, we owe him thanksgiving supremely. Not only because of creation and covenant, but because we are his child. That's what our text really implies in a deep saving way. It says in verse 3, we are his people. Not just an external covenant, but an internal covenant. We are His people in a saving way. When you consider, dear children of God, that Jesus Christ left His throne, as it were, and came into this earth and and, and laid down His life for you as the good and the great and the chief shepherd and gave everything for you, will you not make a joyful noise before Him today? A triple calling lies upon you, dear believer. You are His creation. You are His covenant. You are His child. Come before Him with singing. It's a matter of propriety. You owe it to God. Everything about you. Everything that God has done for you. Everything that God is for you, even now at the right hand, in His Son and in your soul by His Spirit, and on the throne as your Heavenly Father, Everything commends your thanksgiving. 
Well, that leads us, secondly, to the prescription of thanksgiving. How are we to go about this? What are we to do? Well, our psalm says, make a joyful noise. A joyful noise. In Hebrew, that refers to also the noise of servants. They, they rise collectively in joyful exultation and praise when their king arrives in their midst or, or their lord or master. They shout for joy to serve him. Verse 2 says, serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. And verse 4, enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. Now, what do all these words mean? Joyful noise and gladness and thanksgiving and praise. It means to have a heart that just, just throbs with gratitude to God. If you're blessed with a wonderful marriage, you know what it means to have your heart just throb when you see your partner. You're just so happy when your partner's home with you or when you see each other. You, you long to be together. You just enjoy each other's presence. You're just so grateful for a God-fearing partner. And you just love him or you love her with all your heart. And you see... Even much more so, because your partner has falls and flaws, flaws and faults as well. But the Lord has none, you see. He's absolutely perfect. And He never makes one mistake. He always gives you what is best for you. Even your afflictions, Hebrews 12, are for our profit. Hard to believe sometimes, but they are. They are. In hindsight, you will know what they, they are afterward. No affliction for the present seems to be joyous, but grievous. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to them that are exercised thereby. This God is so good to you that he knows better what's good for you than you do for yourself, and he will trump your very desires and your very prayers, and he will give you more than you ask for. He will give you what you should have been asking for in the first place. And so if your heart is throbbing when you see your partner with joy and it swells with gratitude because you love him or you love her, how much more every morning when we arise from our beds should not our hearts throb with joy that we are saved children of the Most High God and that the very prescription of thanksgiving ought to be one of spontaneity, one of responsiveness, one of gladness, one of singing, one of joy, one of praise, one of thanksgiving. A few weeks ago, I was doing a conference in the South, and there was a man that came up to me. He was handicapped, and I asked him how he was doing. For a million dollars, I wouldn't have traded places with him. And he said to me, I've never been so happy in all my life. And I asked him what he meant by that. And he said, well, you see, for many years I had this handicap. And I focused on my handicap. And I felt sorry for myself. But last year, I read in Ephesians to give thanks to God always in all things. And I've asked the Lord every morning since that time to make me thankful today for my handicap. And he began to cry, and he said to me, I cannot tell you how that has revolutionized my whole attitude and my whole life. Because now I wake up every morning thankful that I'm alive, not only, but thankful for the very handicap that was the burden to me before. You see, this is the prescription for thanksgiving. To thank God 
in all things. But how can you do that? Well, you can't without the Holy Spirit's help. Of course not. But the Holy Spirit can cultivate that spirit in you. But how does he do that? In you. Well, by teaching you to look to Jesus. To look to your thanking high priest and what he has done for you. Paul says in Philippians 4, verse 6, In everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he says in Colossians 2, verses 6 and 7, that because of and in Christ, we are to overflow with thanksgiving to God. This, after all, is our ultimate reason, our primary ground of thanksgiving, that we are united to the Lord Jesus Christ, and if we're in union with Him, all shall be well for this life and for a better. And so really, this is the way to begin each day. To thank God for the unspeakable gift of His Son. Because it's in Christ that we find the ultimate ground of thanksgiving, the cause of it, the source of it, the return of it, the essence of it. It's all Christological. And so even in our shortcomings, we're to bring our poor prayers, our poor prayers, our poor thanksgivings, as I mentioned in prayer, to, to this Savior. And he, he can salt them with the salt of his own meritorious sufferings and present them acceptable to the Father. So we learn thanksgiving in Jesus, from Jesus, and we bring it back to Jesus. In Christ, we find everything. We find our source of prayer. We find our source of thanksgiving. He's not only our justification, he's also our sanctification. So ask Jesus to give you the spirit that that handicapped man had, to be thankful every day even for your greatest burden. And begin with Jesus. Thank the Lord in Jesus for everything. When I was a young boy, I, I was for several years in, involved in Gideon's, the, the, the Bible distributors. And there was a man there who led the meetings each month. I don't remember his name. I don't remember anything he said except one thing. Every single prayer, every single meeting, without fail, he began his prayer this way. Triune God, thanks be unto thee for thy unspeakable gift. And then he would go on in his prayer. After I heard that three or four times, it began to strike me. This man is a man who knows true gratitude in Christ. You see, we don't just enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise, or something that we conjure up, but we do it with substance. And the substance is Jesus Christ. This is why we can enter into God's courts with thanksgiving. Because God has sent His Son for sinners like we are. And we repent before Him and we trust in Him. And He's our, our, our total salvation. We have life in Him. We have eternal life in Him. We have everything in Him. All things shall work together for good in, in Him. Why shouldn't we be thankful? So our prescription is that we are thankful in Jesus Christ, and so we enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Yes, but what if you're having such hard times, you can't see beyond the hard times? Well, tell that to God. And ask God to help you. And thank the Lord, even when you can't feel it as much as you desire, thank him anyhow. And ask him for more feeling. 
That's fine. But remember, you see, if you're a believer, whatever he's doing with you is for your good. So even if you can only believe that in your mind and you can't feel it in your heart, thank him with your mind. Take with you words, Hosea 14, and return unto the Lord with thanksgiving. You remember Daniel? Boys and girls, in Daniel 6, Daniel knew, Daniel knew that the king had signed a decree that whoever would go on and pray and thank his God other than the Babylonian leader, would be thrown into the den of lions. So what does Daniel do? Daniel goes to his bedroom, doesn't hide behind the corner, his open window faces Jerusalem, he kneels exactly where he always kneeled, knowing the enemies are going to be looking at him, knowing they're going to report it to the king, knowing he's going to be thrown into the den of lions, and the Bible says Daniel gave thanks unto his God he prayed and gave thanks to his God as he did aforetime. You ever think about those words? As he did aforetime. In other words, he didn't change. He was in the habit of thanking God. He knew the den of lions was coming. He knew the very act of his prayer, the very act of his giving thanks would be responsible for throwing him into the den of lions. And he said, give me the den of lions before I will stop thanking God. Give me the choice. Throw me into the den of lions with a thankful spirit or keep me out of the den of lions with an unthankful spirit. I'd pick the lions. Because a thankful spirit is more than life to me. Here's a man who knew what it was to give thanks in the greatest of needs. Oh, may God help us to understand that his chastenings of us, dear children of God, are paternal. They're not judicial. They're not to destroy us. They're medicine to heal us, to mature us, to bring us close to himself. Trust him. And go and pray to your God and give thanks as you did aforetime. In the midst of your suffering. In the midst of our congregational suffering with our dear pastor right now. It applies to us as well, doesn't it? Let's give thanks to God. God's going to do great things with this. He will. It will be for our profit. Let's go to him as we did aforetime, giving thanks to our God in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, let's sing before our last two thoughts that will be expounded briefly. Psalter 270. Oh, make a joyful noise, ye lands, and serve the Lord with fear, 270.
What really is the purpose of thanksgiving? That's our third thought, the purpose. Well, the end of verse 4 teaches us that. Be thankful unto him and you will feel good. And bless his name. That's the purpose. Now, there are many purposes to thanksgiving, of course. It humbles us. It, that's good for us. It stimulates our faith. That's good for us. It fosters contentment. That's good for us. But the supreme purpose of thanksgiving is to bless, that is, to lift up, to praise, to exalt the name of God, to worship God, to focus on God. We enter into these courts with thanksgiving, said the psalmist, so that we might praise God and bless his name. Let me try to explain something to you I think that is very important. If we come to church to feel good, as one man told me recently, I go to church to feel good. Or we come to church to have experiences. Or we come to church that we might leave in a frame of mind that we feel relieved of our guilt. All important things. But they won't be realized because we don't realize these things by coming for these things. We realize these things when we come to bless God and lift Him up and praise His name. And it's only when we praise His name and bless Him and extol Him and center on Him and worship Him that when we leave church we'll realize how good we feel. And what a sweet experience it was to exalt the Lord. And how truly content we are in our souls when we focused on Him. You see, many things in life are like that, aren't they? You don't get them by looking for the thing you're looking for. You don't get happiness by looking for happiness. You don't get happiness by sitting in a chair and saying, I wish I could be happy. You get happiness as a byproduct of obedience, as a byproduct of glorifying God, living for the purpose for which God designed you. Think of it this way, boys and girls. If you disobey your teacher and you know there's a big exam come next Tuesday morning, and Monday night you waste your time and you spend the whole night surfing on the computer, and you get up Tuesday morning, you say, I didn't study at all for my test. You go, you take the test, you bomb out, you're sure you failed, you come home, how do you feel? You feel rotten. But now let's say on Monday evening, you obey your teacher, you know that you've got a test tomorrow, and you study hard, you do your very best, and the next day, things go very well. How do you feel when you come home? Well, you feel a lot better. It's just in a practical daily thing. But that's that way in all things, also spiritual things. If you come to church and you come to get something for yourself, first and foremost, rather than to give glory to God and praise His name and bless Him and give Him thanks, you probably go away empty-handed. And you feel lousy. And you come again the next week. Oh, if only I could experience something this week. And you don't again. And you don't again. But if you come to bless Him, and you come to exalt Him, and as you worship, you exalt Him in singing, you exalt Him as you pray along with the minister in prayer, you exalt Him under the sermon, you give thanks to His name. When you go home, you realize you've experienced something invaluable. You've experienced a joy and a peace that passes understanding. So, the things we look for are often byproducts of the thing we should look for supremely, which is the purpose of thanksgiving. To bless God's name. To be thankful. 
That's why the Heidelberg Catechism says God only continues to give his gifts to those who are thankful for them and bless his name for them. Last night at the HHOM, boys and girls, I told a story about a boy getting a new bike. If you got a new bike from your mom or your dad, it was a beautiful, shiny new bike, but it wasn't exactly the model of bike you wanted and you weren't thankful. In fact, if you were, you were angry because you didn't get the right exact bike and you threw it on the ground and you took a stick and you started beating on the bike and you came back and you said, Mom and Dad, I want a new bike. What would your mom and dad say? <laughs> They'd say, no way. No new bike for you. In fact, I'm going to make you pay for the bike that you destroyed. Because you're not thankful. And you see, so often we're just murmurers, even, re even religious murmurers. We murmur against God for this, we murmur against God for that, and then when affliction comes, we ought not be surprised if we're not in the habit of blessing and thanking Him for everything. We ought not be surprised that we act no better than the world acts when we get afflicted. And we say things like this, well, I guess you just have to grin and bear, or there's no, no, nothing else I guess to do but take it to God, as if God can't help you. I'm guilty just like you, my friend. We ought to be a thousand times more thankful than we are. Oh God, help us to cultivate this spirit of thanksgiving that we might bless thy name, bless thee and see thee in everything and begin there and continue there and end there and then we will experience the byproduct of contentment and true joy. Give thanks unto God and bless his name. Well, that leads me then to my last thought. Just briefly now, how do you practice this thanksgiving? What are some tips? How do you cultivate it? How can you not stray away from this and fall back into those old patterns of murmuring and grieving and not being thankful to God? Well, I've got five quick thoughts for you here as we close this morning. Number one, live in close fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ through dependency on the Spirit, of course, live in close fellowship. You see, as we abide in Him through His Word, as we see His power at work in us and through us, as we call upon Him for our needs and experience His provision, as we respond in thanksgiving and live out of the Lord Jesus Christ, we will experience more and more thanksgiving. The more thankful we are, it's like multiplication. The more thankful we are, the more thankful we'll be. It multiplies itself exponentially. It's contagious. It's contagious. When the Spirit gives us a thankful spirit, through fellowship with Jesus Christ, we become all the more, the more, the more thankful for this wonderful, glorious, beautiful Savior. Number two. Pray against ingratitude and hardness of heart. When you come into God's courts, come with thanksgiving. And if you don't feel that thanksgiving, say, Oh God, open my eyes to the marvelous fact that in just a few minutes as I sit in this pew, I'm going to be hearing thy voice coming to me. The God of heaven and earth wants to visit with me. and has a message from his Holy Spirit to me. What a wonder, what a glory. Meditate on these things and pray against this, this taking for granted all these stupendous blessings of God. So often we take everything for granted, don't we? Take our spouses for granted, take our children for granted, take our parents for granted, take church for granted, take the ministry of the Word for granted, take the means of grace for granted, take God for granted. Ask God to show you what you deserve and to break that hard heart and to compare what you deserve to what you're receiving. And if you can see those two things at once, you will be thankful because there's such a chasm between the two. It's unbelievable. 
God is always far, far better to us than we are to Him. In fact, God is always best to us in our deepest moments of affliction when He seems to come against us as our greatest enemy than we are to Him in our most holy and sacred moments when we seem to be so converted. God is amazing. His goodness knows no bounds. Verse 5 says, For the Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endures to all generations. Ask God to deliver you from this hard, hard heart. Say, Lord, thou hast created me for one purpose, to thank Thee, to bless Thy name, to hallow Thy name, to praise Thee. Take my heart, open my eyes, touch my spirit, that everything in me may breathe forth Thy praises. Let everything that hath breath Praise the Lord. Number three, cultivate the habit of that handicapped friend that always gave thanks to God for everything. You know, I think I've said this at one point some time ago, but when you go different places in the world, you hear people pray, and sometimes there's different customs, but... I've been really struck by the prayers in Northern Ireland, by God's people in Northern Ireland. Because they usually begin with one, two, to three, maybe five minutes sometimes of just thanking God. Not a shallow thank you, but a profound thanks. Thanking God for His character, thanking Him for His word, thanking Him for His day, thanking Him for His gospel, thanking Him for His people, thanking Him for the communion of saints. And they go on and on. And it's, it's from the heart. It's just wonderful. This attitude of thanksgiving. We can learn so much from these dear saints. Psalm 92 says, It is good to praise the Lord and make music to thy name, O Most High, to proclaim... Thy praise is in the morning and thy faithfulness every night. If you have a hard time being thankful, why not, why not write down a list of 50 to 100 things for which you should be thankful and pray through them 10 at a time or so. Just pray and thank the Lord. So many things. Thank Him for your personal salvation. Thank Him for the opportunities for spiritual growth. Thank Him for the availability of the Bible. Thank Him for the instruction and fellowship of this church and its ministries. Thank Him for the the, the immense help of all the abundance of godly Christian literature. Thank Him for the opportunities you have to minister to people and serve to people. Thank Him for your family. Thank Him for, for children who might know the Lord Jesus Christ and are growing up in Him. Thank Him for the health of your family. Thank Him for the political freedom we have. Thank Him for the material provision for your family needs. Develop an attitude of thanksgiving. Fourth, make thanksgiving, make thanksgiving a regular part of your intercessory prayer time. In other words, have people you're thanking God for people that mean a lot to you. And pray for them. And pray for them with thanksgiving. Isn't that what Paul is always doing? It's just striking from letter to letter to letter. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for da, da, da. You Corinthians, you Ephesians, you Philippians. He's always bringing them in prayer. He's always telling them that he's thanking God for them. How often do you thank God for your God-fearing spouse? How often do you thank God for these God-fearing office bearers? How often do you thank God for children who are obedient? Do you realize what a rarity that is in today's culture? What a gift an obedient child is to you? Thank God for specific people in your prayer and lift up their needs with thanksgiving. And number five, fill your mind with the Word of God. Fill your mind with the Word of God. Meditate 
on the scriptures, memorize the scriptures, know the scriptures, love the scriptures, live the scriptures, immerse yourself, saturate yourself with the word of God. That will give you strength when the trials come to not be knocked off of this attitude of thanksgiving, but to stand firm and be thankful even in the midst of affliction. That will give you strength to cultivate thanksgiving. It will give you fodder to do so as you pray, as you bring God back his own word. Fill your mind with the word of God. Thomas Goodwin put it this way, it is unthankfulness when Christians are always whining and complaining and discontent for what they want, but never praising God for what they have, still begging for more. In duties, indeed, you are to look to what is before you and not to what is behind you. But in mercies, you are to look to what is past more than what is to come. When you look past in this year, are there not thousands of reasons to be thankful to God? And are you blessing Him daily for these very reasons? Finally, my unconverted friend, I'm afraid that you don't know what it means to really be thankful to God. God says in Ezekiel 35, Thou takest my gold and silver and makest idols by them. You see, when we don't use our bodies, we don't use our minds, we don't use our souls, we don't use our affections, we don't use our consciences, we don't use our hands and our feet to truly serve God and fear Him and love Him and bless Him when the driving thrust of our life is not God in Jesus Christ and the longing passion of our soul is not to serve Him and love Him and fear Him when we're living for ourselves. We're really not thankful for anything. You see, if Jesus could say to His enemies, for which of these good works do you stone me, Cannot God save us? For which of my mercies do you go on sinning against me? You remember the irony of a recent war, don't you, when it was said that the enemy fighting us was using U.S.-made weapons. We gave the weapons to a friendly nation. They, in turn, gave them to another nation. And they, in turn, gave them to our enemy. And our own weapons were being used against us. When you don't live for God, that's what you're doing. That's what you're doing. You're rendering God evil for all his good. You're taking all his benefits. You're taking the benefit of your eyes and you're sinning with them. You're rendering him evil with your eyes. You're rendering him evil with your hands. You're not loving him above all. You're not living, loving your neighbors yourself. You're consuming everything upon yourselves. Oh, that you would leave this house of God this morning as a convicted sinner for your own ingratitude and your own hardness of heart, that you would bow and confess, Lord, I've abused, I've been abusing thy mercies all my life. Don't make God's mercies like so many coals heaped upon you to stoke the fires of hell. But humble yourself. Humble yourself before God and be persuaded that nothing will condemn you more than sinning against God's light and God's mercies and God's gifts with ingratitude and impenitence. Repent. Trust the Savior and ask for a thankful spirit so that you too can find coming to church exciting, entering into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise to bless him and to say the Lord, he is our God and we are his sheep and of his pasture to him be all the glory, now and forever. Amen.
Gracious God, may old 100's call to thanksgiving penetrate the depths of our soul. May it arrest us from our backsliding ways when we are children of God, but may it also arrest us when we are unsaved to see what we are missing and to turn back to Thee and seek redemption in Thy Son. But also may it encourage us and that we might know more what it means to excel in rendering Thee thanks and giving Thee glory. O Lord, help us to cultivate this practice of thanksgiving. Show us its propriety. Show us its prescription. Show us its purpose. And then move us to prayer. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.